Uh, today is the seventh, uh, so I will repeat. Uh, thanks, I appreciate that. The slide should now be online, ready to go. Um, were there any other questions that were not about not being able to access the slides? All right. Well, cool. okay, so now we're going to start right where we left off, I believe, on Monday. So we're talking about type systems. We're talking about how how does a language designer, how does a language define what types of operations are valid and what types are valid. And so we talked about being able to, uh, the four things uh, that are necessary for a type system. Anybody remember what those four things are? Anybody can go back two slides and their slides that they're looking at right now? What's the first thing? What do you need in any type system? Basic types. Yeah, you gotta have basic types, right? Otherwise, you can't build any other types on top of that. Uh, so you need basic types. What do you need on top of that? Type constructors. Yes, the title of this slide. Good guess for whoever said that. Uh, the third thing. What was it? Type inference. Yes, we're gonna get into that. And the fourth one. Type. What was it? Type declaration. Sorry. Compatibility, yeah, I was thinking it's too small to see. Okay, yeah, so those are the four things that we need. Okay, so now we're talking about type constructors. So how do we as a programmer say we want new types in the system? Uh, well, one is we can just use maybe a basic type. Uh, another one is we can declare we want a pointer to some type uh, where T is the type. So this is kind of the syntax we're gonna use right now when talking about kind of type systems in the abstract. So here we're gonna talk about just pointer to T where T is some type that's already previously defined. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about structs. So we're gonna talk about structures. Um, and so here we're gonna represent that very similar-ish to C, where we have curly braces, then we have uh, various fields, A, I through A, K, and each of those fields has an associated type. Um, and so this is where it is, where A, I is the field name, and T, I is some previously, well, is some type could be previously defined. Uh, questions on structs? Right now we're just kind of defining how to build. So you can build structures by combining any number of previous types in kind of any order, which is fun. Okay, then we have arrays. So we have an array of a specific range of some type, uh, where the range can be single or multi-dimensional. We'll see in a little bit today an example of what this range looks like. Uh, so. Is this, I don't know, does C have a way of defining a, an array of a range of a type? The C++? Yes, no, no wrong answers. There's a lot less of you, there should be more, more interaction, right? Mm. I can. Uh, so the question is, can you define an array of a range of values, either single or multidimensional, in C? You mean like how much memory it'll take? I don't know. Can you define this a type of an array, array of some type? You can guess. That's okay to guess. We can talk about it. Yes, no? You can guess the entire class. Yeah. I vote yes. You vote yes. <laughs> so how do you define an array of a range of types in C? So I'm assuming that a range means a, a memory space. Is that what we're talking about? A uh, range would be the number of elements in, in the array. Then and, how, and you can even say, and how to index those elements. Is it 0 through 5 would be a 6 element array? Uh, is it 1 through 5, which would be a 5 element array? Uh, can you have negative indices? So can you do like negative five to five or something like that? Yes. So yes, you can. <coughs> Not so. Yeah, I don't think you can do the negative five. But you definitely can't do the negative. Can you set like a lower bound on the index of an, of an array? No, you can just set an upper bound. You can right? set the upper bound, right? But what actually does that type get compiled to? So when you declare like an int bracket 10 and then some name, what's does it actually have a type of int array? It's like an int size of 10. So it's actually an int star. So it's actually just a pointer to that chunk of memory that happens to be a size of 10. So 
Uh, C is a little bit weird because it, you can kind of define this, but you can't actually say this is a type of array and it has five elements. Um, whereas in other languages, you actually can. You can actually do that and say, hey, here's an array. It's specifically got five elements, and you can even give the indices of that. It's actually a const star, right? Uh, is it a const yeah, pointer? It's, it's uh, const yes, star. I believe that's. <laughs> and so you can't pass a star to it. Has a star to it. Like if you wanted to like have, uh, make putting equals to an int star to like content star, you can't do that. It'll fail in compiler. Possibly. Okay, so it's adding other type information, but it's not a type of an array. Sure. Right. Okay. That's good. Uh, yeah, we should test that. That'd be fun. Uh, okay, and we can also define functions, right? So functions have a type. So what would a type be of a function? How would you try to want to type a function? Return type. Return type. Definitely important. Is that all you need? Yeah. Uh, parameter types? Yeah, all the parameter types, right? So those kind of all together can make up the type of a function. Uh, so here we're just declaring that we have a function, and it accepts parameter types t1 through tk, and it returns a type t. So this is we're saying that the type of whatever we're declaring as a variable is a function, and it has these input parameter types, t1 through tk, and it returns some type T. <laughs> oh no, I don't have animations on the next slide. Okay, we'll have to, we'll be fine. Okay, so there's two types. So uh, when we declare, we can also declare, in some sense, aliases of types, or we can declare a certain type. So uh, one way to do it, so in a language like C, we can say type def. So we can say, hey, type def uh, cm. So here this would be centimeter, which is, at its base, an integer, right? So we can actually, as programmers, we can define new types, even if they're not combinations, or even if they're not pointers, structures, uh, arrays, or functions, right? We can create new types. Uh, so here we've created a type centimeter that's really an integer. Uh, we're creating a type RGBA, which is an array of zero through four. Oh, I think I may be off by one there, of type integer. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, of some type of, so it's an array of integers, so that's how just in this kind of type syntax we're specifying the range here. But I can build on that type, right? So I can build an array of 200, 0 to 256 of RGBA values where each type in there is an array from 0 to 4 of type integer. So questions on that? Declare types, we can declare new types, which is important. Okay, we can also have types with no names, right? So we can have anonymous <coughs> types. Um, so this is actually possible in, so this array, so here we're saying that we're declaring a variable x, and what's the type of x? Was it? Almost. So here we basically, so you can think about it kind of like C where we have the type and then we have the variable name. What was it? It's an array of 0 to 4 of type. Yeah, so it's an array of 0 to 4. So it's a five length array from 0 to 4. And it has each of those is type int. Right? And we're calling it x. But that, or, so up, the difference is up here we defined a new type. So we gave this type a name so we could refer to it later. But here we're just saying that, hey, we have this variable x and it has this type, but this type has no name. So this is actually uh, definitely possible in C as well. So you ever wonder why you have to put a semicolon at the end of a struct definition in C and C++? Yes? Because it's the exact same way you define, you declare, you're, you're technically <coughs> declaring a type you can give a, a type of a struct, you can give it a name, and you can also assign variables to that type. Uh, so that's why you can do that, where you don't need to do that with functions, because those are something completely different. Uh, so here we're defining, so this is actually valid C syntax. You can go put this into C or C++, this will compile. So here we're defining a variable Y, and what's the type of Y? What kind of a struct? Yeah, struct that holds an int in field A and a char in field B. 
Does this structure have a name? No. Oh, so y is the variable name. So we're declaring the variable. Uh, if I wanted to give it a name, I'd put it here, right? I'd say struct something, and then I'd have the definition. Uh, but, so this is where anonymous comes in, right? So here we have a type with no name that we can define a variable as having a specific type. Do you think it's useful? Yes. Yes, when is it useful? If you only need one of that type. Yeah, if you only ever need one of that type, it could be useful to define it maybe for a specific function. When would you be in that situation where you only need one type of a variable? Shrugs. <laughs> You start off with it's useful and then... I don't know when that would be useful, but it could be. <laughs> it could be useful. It's a singleton. Yeah, it could be a singleton. Maybe you only ever need it or declare it once. That's a good one. You could use it, yeah, as, as a singleton, maybe as far uh, to define maybe some global state or something like that in a game or something. Uh, but then you'd have other ways of like saving that state and loading it. OK, so does everybody get the difference here between these two declarations? <laughs> So what do these three all have in common? What was it? Arrays. Arrays? Uh, this one doesn't have an array. Close, yeah. Yeah, they have names. So they're all types that are defined and they have names. Whereas these types here don't have names. There's variables that have these types, but the types themselves do not have names. OK, so maybe you're thinking this is really pedantic and crazy and weird, but it is very important. Uh, when, it talk, when we come to talk about type compatibility. So which assignments, so type compatibility really boils down to what assignments are allowed by the type system. So the question is, if you have an assignment of A equals A gets the value of B, or A is assigned B, right? is this allowed by the type system? So if A is an int and B is a float, is it allowed? You answered no. <laughs> Somebody else? Or a change? Yeah. Depends on the language. Yeah. So what what languages would this maybe be allowed in, and what would it not be? Do you have any? I mean, huh? Ruby would allow this. Actually, don't know. That'd be a good. Well, that's, that's a good point. Ruby does allow a lot of things. So that would actually also not surprise me. Uh, in C, you can also do this as well. You can assign a float. So what's the, what's the big problem of allowing this? So we want to. Yeah. What? So you're saying that? Whatever he said. Whatever he said. I don't think you're allowed to do that. But yeah. Loss of information. What information are we losing? Stuff that float can store that it can't. Yeah, so a float right, is, has some decimal part, which you really can't represent in an integer. And integers don't have a decimal part. So fundamentally, if you just think about it like that, you're losing some information. Um, yeah, so in this case, it's up to the language designer to say, hey, do I want to allow this? And just say, hey, you have to be careful. If you're ever assigning a float to an int, you're going to miss that, those decimal points. Uh, the other thing is, well, how does this how does this conversion happen? Is, it, is the float rounded to the nearest integer? Is it just that decimal part is thrown away? So these are all decisions that have to be made. And so if you allow this, you have to be very clear in the language, hey, this is exactly what happens. What about the other way around? Yeah. No, can't do that? Yeah. Why? You started off by saying no, and at the end you weren't so sure. Did you talk yourself out of a no? Yeah. Do you want to defend the yes now, or do you want somebody else to? Yeah? I mean, does it, does it um, see the way that it defines a float, though, very different from the way it defines an int? Because you just use basic binary to define an int, but then with the, uh, but with, uh, when you're defining a float, and mm -hmm. like the way that it works with the decimal point, I forgot there's certain, there's certain way that it does it differently, right? So 
question is, uh, if I can sum that up, is there a weird way that floats are defined as opposed to ints? Uh, so at the basic level, they're all just bits, right? Uh, and so there's 32 bits, I believe, in, uh, I'll say in a float in an int, but I actually don't know if that's true, if it's 32 or 64. Uh, but I think what you're referring to is that uh, the int is going to be stored in two's complement integer form, whereas the float is going to be stored in whatever IEEE floating point yeah. precision specification is um, to actually specify, because it has to keep track of what's the decimal part and what's the, um, the non-decimal part, which has a name, which I don't remember right now. Um, but you know, if the compiler knows how to convert between an int and a float, right, it can insert the instructions to do that into here. Um, are, are we, I guess another way to think of it is are we losing any information from going from an int to a float? No. No? I mean, yes? The big question is, what are the ranges of floats and what are the ranges of ints? And is there any possibility where like, max int can't be represented as a float? So this I don't know 100%. We'd have to look that up. Are you shaking your head from experience? You can do it without, without losing precision? Yeah, because every int can be represented. Yeah. Okay, these are all good points. Uh, so the real thing is, is it goes back to the original answer of it depends on the type system, right? So the type system may either allow it or disallow it. I think in C it would allow this and do it automatically because you shouldn't be losing type information. Um, but I'm not 100%, yeah. I mean, shouldn't it allow it though? Because I think the art isn't a flow type uh, given more memory than it type. In that case, if the compiler or whatever knows how to convert between ints and floats, then you're basically, you're just giving more information to store that int. I mean, you're giving more space to store that int. Right, so yeah, I think that's that's the big question, is if it's more space. I think it is. I think <coughs> float is maybe, I want to say 64 bits, but I'm not 100% certain on that. So I think float is double the amount that's Probably, but we'd have to look at it. Anyway, so that's the whole point, right, is we have to look at it, and you as a language designer have to define hey, what things are actually allowed? Are these types compatible? Can I assign them one to another? And if you do allow that, well, then you have to define what, how that conversion takes place for the built-in type. OK, type inference. Um, type inference is very important. So this is how the compiler, this is actually one of the coolest things, and we're going to get into this a lot uh, in maybe the next lecture, but this is how the compiler or the interpreter is able to infer the type of an expression. So uh, remember, expressions are sequences of operations, right? They're very broadly defined. Uh, and so, for instance, what is the type of A plus B? What is the result of that, of that expression? What's the type of that expression? Is it explicitly specified by the programmer here? No. So assuming that types for A and B are already declared, can we infer what the type of A plus B is? What was it? Say it louder. Yeah, so it, it's one of these things that, well, A, whether it's allowed or not, depends on what the language semantics are and what the language type system says. Uh, but specifically, that's what type inference rules talk about. Is so, okay. Uh, we have A plus B, can we infer what the result of that type is? Because we may be using that in another expression, right? We may do A plus B times C divided by 20. So we want to know what the result of that uh, expression is. So if the type is A is an integer and B is a float, what's the type of this expression in, let's say, C? Float, why? Because? 
Because it retains the decimal portion? Because it retains the decimal portion? So yeah, so if we did, so if we, if we cast the float b to an integer and then did the addition to get an integer, well then we've lost the decimal value that was originally in b. Uh, so in c, it actually returns a float. But different languages do this completely differently. So there's languages like the ML family of languages. Uh, it's actually an error. So they have different operations like addition and division depending on if the operands are integers versus floats. And so that forces the program writer to be very aware of what the types of their variables are and how they can be used uh, so that that way this accidental maybe type conversion doesn't take place when they don't intend it to. Uh, what about this? A and A times B. So that's an expression, yeah. I just have a question with yeah. this one before, I guess A times B. Doesn't it matter what you're storing, storing that expression type of, so I mean if you said like int, a, int, int C is equal to A plus B versus float C is equal to A plus B, wouldn't it depend on how much memory you have? So the question is, uh, does it depend? So remember, right now we're not talking about memory at all. Right? We're talking about abstract type systems. And so the type system, each type defines a set of values right, that that type can represent. Um, and so specifically here in type inference, we're just saying, hey, what's the type, what's the resulting type of this expression? Then to decide on that assignment, right, we'd go back to what are the type compatibility specifications for that language. Can we, can we assign, is the type of the result of the expression, is that compatible with whatever you're trying to put it in? All right, so this has something to do with, so if I said in C is equal to A plus B, A plus B returns a float, and you're trying to store a float in C, so that would be fine. Yeah, it would be fine. It would depend on whether you can store, whether a float you can assign it to an integer. Okay, so A times B. What if A is a string and B is an integer? Is this, what's the, result type of this expression? Yeah. Depend on the language, like in Python it's Depends a string. on the language, give me a language. Python. Python. It's a string. Yeah, so Python, so what is it going to be in most other languages? An error. An error, right? The, in most languages, if you try to multiply a string by an integer, it really doesn't make sense, so it's going to error. Um, Python is very weird, but it does come in handy sometimes. <coughs> where it's actually going to return a string. So it's going to return the string A B number of times. That's going to be the resulting string. Um, but the point is that the type, the type inference options here are different depending on the language that we're talking about here. Perl does that too. That's probably where Python got it from, is my guess. But it still seems very evil. Ruby does it as well. Interesting. Any other languages? What is uh, I think JavaScript does not. I think I tried it in JavaScript. I thought it would have worked, actually, but surprisingly it doesn't. OK, so we just talked about type inference, right? So type <coughs> inference is how do we infer the result of an expression? Now, type compatibility, so this is where we're going to go into detail here. So type compatibility is principally the principal question here is what types are actually equivalent. Uh, meaning that what is the compiler, what does the type system think of two types being equal? So if we have a type of a centimeter, which we de define it to be an integer, and we have a type inch that we define to be an integer, and we declare a variable x that has a type of centimeter, and we declare a variable y that has type of inch, can we assign x equals to y? They said no. Why no? Yeah. Because they're both defined as different types. They're, one is a centimeter and one is an inch. And they are not compatible. They, they don't aren't the same. But they're still, they're still integers. Right. But we, we're, we don't see that part. We only see that it's six. That it's seven. So give me an argument for why you wouldn't want them to be able because to be assigned like this. If I assign one centimeter um, that at a certain length, that's different than one inch. Right, so I'm trying to, I'm representing semantic information about my program where the variable x is some number of centimeters. It really doesn't make sense to be able to just copy, turn 10 <laughs> centimeters and copy that into a variable that's inches because then that's 10 inches, which definitely isn't the same value. Yeah? Do you have your hand up? What is that, that handled by the processor? What is that 
Uh, this is handled by the, uh, by the compiler or interpreter bef after it does all the parsing, checks all the semantics, then it checks the types, basically. So that's another step in the types of something, <coughs> depending. Yeah? Which is the information stored when there is a conversion that does allow when it's the conversion of one type to another? Is it stored in the inches or is it stored in the centimeters? I don't understand. So like, you know how you can change a float to an integer? Ah, uh -huh. uh, And you, you do that by writing a specific conversion in that particular class or, uh, or type. <coughs> I think that's definitely an implementation dependent question because yeah, it depends on specifically the implementation. Um, for basic types, those are defined in the language, right? So that has to be defined as to what types you can convert from one to the other two without saying anything. And then if you do it explicitly, exactly what the semantics are for all the basic types. Um, and then for, depending on how types are defined like this, then that's a whole nother level that completely depends on the language itself. Uh, for a language like, uh, let's say, Scala, if you define a way to convert between centimeters and, and inches, it'll actually allow you to do this and automatically apply that conversion to this assignment statement. Um, but, so the question is, so, okay, so we found an argument for why you wouldn't want to be able to, why this assignment statement shouldn't be valid and shouldn't type check, but what would, are there examples, when would you want to? Yeah. Like in C, you want to give one. C gives you so much access to memory, you want to give ultimate control of the programmer himself. So if he chooses to do that, then he has the right to do that regardless. Of right, so C would be, uh, yeah, I guess the C argument would kind of be low level language, maybe has, you want more direct access to directly to memory and all that, all those things. Um, one way would be, it could be really annoying. You would probably not define types like this if every time you tried to use them or convert between them, it would give you an error. Does anybody? actually do this when they write their programs or like maybe projects in this class? Uh, did you define special types for all of the, like did you find an, I don't know, the same enum that represents whether a symbol is a terminal, non-terminal, or yeah, some people? Um, I'm trying to think of other examples where this might be good. Uh, so it's good in the sense that it can, so by stopping this, right, we can restrict the set of programs that the programmer writes, and so maybe we're forcing them to write safer programs, but then the flip side is we could get in their way, and maybe the programmer does want to convert directly from whatever, some integer to another integer, uh, and wants to do that. So, uh, so what we're gonna get into now is all the different cases, all the different types of type compatibility that define whether this is allowed or not allowed. So the first one is name equivalence, which is exactly what it sounds like. So the types have to have the exact same name to be equivalent, right? Otherwise, they're not equivalent. So in the case we saw previously, we have a type centimeter, a type inch, x, y. So we'd say, can we assign x to y? Or y, or an inch to a centimeter? Why? Yeah, they're not the same type. They're not the exact same name, right? So that's going to error out. And that's going to block this. Uh, so what if we also maybe, uh, so now what the question is, okay, what happens when we have that with anonymous types, right? Types that have no name, right? So here we're defining A as an array of zero to four integers. And then we define a variable B as an array of zero to four integers. So now I want to ask the question, is A equal to B? Intuitively, what do you think it should be with name equivalence? Can I raise your hand? Is that allowed? Defend your position? Yeah? Yes. Why? So yes, but we're using name. We're using name equivalence. So what is what is really the question here? What is the name of the name of B? Yeah, what's the name of the type of A and what's the name of the type of B? So do they have names? The 
compiler probably knows that we're integers. Uh, does this say anything about like the compiler needs to be smart to figure out the, the names are equivalent? It's a good, you, should, you gotta think of, keep that in mind. We're getting there, but what does it say? Have to be the exact same name. I guess it's a question, so two things that have, don't have a name, can they have the exact same name? Yes? No? It's a null string, so then any anonymous type would always be equal with any other anonymous type? <coughs> so who thinks it should be allowed? Who thinks it shouldn't be allowed? The rest of you have no opinion? Just want to move on to Okay. Uh, Okay, so not allowed under name equivalence, right? So these A and B both have anonymous types. The type of A is some anonymous thing. The type of B is some anonymous thing. Those can never be equal. So we can never have these be equal under name equivalence. Okay. So now we have the question. We're defining two variables, a and b, that are both the type of array 0 through 4 of integer. Same thing, but now the declarations are on the same line. So can we set a is equal to b? And with using name equivalents of what we just said. We're not argue one way or the other. You don't have to be right. Yeah. Yes. yes, why? So they both technically have the same name even though it's anonymous. But it doesn't have a name because it's anonymous. Tell me I'm wrong. No, I don't even think about it. Because uh, I, I mean, it could, you could, I could see arguments honestly for both ways. Yeah. Yeah, my argument uh, for why it should be allowed is because. Okay, so the argument is, well, the compiler has to give them some name, right? So they're anonymous, but the compiler has to have some way of knowing what variables have what types, and so it's got to have some way to assign that to an anonymous name. Um, but I guess the question is, I guess maybe by the way we defined it, but then aren't we specifying something about the compiler behavior that it has to always give the same type on the same declaration, because it could be that I could see this and I could compile this as an A of type array. Like semantically, this is identical to the previous one, right? Where you have two declarations of that. Yeah? So is there a set of rules that we have for name equivalents yeah. that have to go across all compilers? Uh, yeah, so it's got to be the exact same name. That's the rule. So, yeah, so. I want you to get you to think about it because it's actually a great way of how we're going to lead to the next one. Uh, but under, you consider it strict name equivalence or name equivalence, these do not have the same name, so it's not allowed because array of 0 to 4 of int is not named. And that's why it has no name, therefore they can't be assigned to each other. It would be a very interesting question if you had A is equal to A, but we'll leave that aside for now. But if we define a type called A of array 0 through 4 of int, and we define A as type big A and B as type big A, now can we assign A is equal to B? Yes. Why? They have the same, they have the same not type, name. name. Yes, they have the same type name. Uh, yes, so it's allowed because both A and B have the same name. And, okay, you're probably thinking, well, this is probably overly strict, right? I think that's kind of the discussion we just had is uh, this seems overly restrictive. So we can relax name equivalence a little bit 
which will give us something that is uh, very similar to what we've been talking about, called internal name equivalents. Right? So this, if the, I call program interpreter, so the compiler or interpreter or type checker or whatever, if it gives the same internal name to two different variables, then they share the same type. And so, does this work for the same for types that have names as name equivalents? It's a type that has, does this work the same as name equivalents for types that have names? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the compiler is going to give internal names to every type that has names, right? And so every type that has a name is going to have the same name, same type. This is definitely going to pass. Uh, the only time where it ever comes up differently is in the cases we've been talking about with anonymous types. Uh, so here we have a Variables A and B, they're both arrays of 0 through 4 of int. And we have C, which is an array of 0 to 4 of type int. So now we want to ask, can we assign A is equal to B? Yes, yeah, because now we're specifying the compiler is going to give the same <coughs> internal name to this type, this anonymous type. And it's going to give that to A and B when we declare them. Uh, so we're going to say, yes, this is allowed. It's going to give it some internal name, some whatever random integer, doesn't really matter. But can we assign A is equal to C? Why? Yeah, different internal name. So the compiler is going to give this, or the interpreter is going to give this a different name because it's, it's a different declaration. So it doesn't go back and check and, oh, have I seen this type before? No, it sees a new anonymous type, so it's going to give it a new, uh, new internal name. Questions on that? Okay. Now we get into something a little bit more uh, interesting. Uh, so now we can actually relax this even more. And this gets back to, well, why don't we have a smarter compiler that can kind of figure things out that these structures are really the same type, right? Because kind of that's what we want, is we want the compiler to be a little bit smart about things. Um, so we're going to define Instead of just talking about the type names, well, why don't we look at the structure of the types to see if the structures are the same? And then we can say that they're the same type. So we have five rules to decide structural equivalence. And it brings up some really interesting uh, issues here. Uh, so one is built-in types. So the same built-in types are the same. right? So int <coughs> is structurally equivalent to an int. Float is structurally equivalent to a float. Uh, right now, we'll just do very basic. They're only equivalent to each other. Uh, you can add more complicated rules on top of that. Uh, what about pointers? What are pointers when two pointers are structurally equivalent? What would that mean? They both point to the same basic type. Yeah, they both point to the same basic type, right? So they're, if you remove the star or the pointer from it, then those types must be the same. So they're pointers to structurally equivalent types. Um, so is this like a recursive definition? What if you have a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to an int? How would you tell that that's structurally equivalent to a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to a float? Should it be structurally equivalent? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so they're pointing to two different basic types, right? So you can keep applying this rule to keep removing references until you get to the underlying basic type. So at the outermost, you have a pointer to some type. It doesn't matter what it is. So this rule, this two says, hey, if those pointers are structurally equivalent types, whatever the type is without the outside pointer, then they're structurally equivalent. So then we say, OK, they're, this, they're both pointer types. So let's remove one of the pointers. And now we have, OK, pointer to something else. And so I know I can remove that from both of them. And I know I can remove that from both of them until finally I get to an int and a float and say, hey, these aren't the same. 
These aren't structurally equivalent. OK, let's look at another example. So we have a type. We're defining centimeters an integer. We're defining a type of an inch. OK, so this is the same example. So now can we say x is equal to y? Yeah, right? Now we can say that x is equal to y. We can copy this. We can do whatever we want because they, they have the same structure. They're the same basic types underneath. Okay, then we can look at the pointer, uh, another pointer example. So we have an int star A, we have a float, a floating pointer B. So is A equal to B? No, some of you are shaking your head. Why not? Dif different base types. Yeah, exactly. So the pointers are pointing to different base types, which means the pointers are not structurally equivalent. Okay. Yeah. In star star C to what? To A. To A? So what do you think? If we had uh, in star star C, could we set A equals C? Yeah. No, because uh, we remove the first outermost pointer, we still have one pointer and an end pointer. Right. So on A, we say are they they're structurally equivalent if uh, the internal types are equivalent, right? So for this pointer, uh, the type of this is pointer to an int. So the internal type is int. On an int star star, the internal type is an int star or a pointer to an int. So we compare those and say, oh, those definitely aren't. This is a basic type. This is a pointer. These are clearly not the same type. Yeah, good question. Okay. Now we have uh, the third rule is, and these are all, so these aren't just arbitrary rules, these talk about how we deal with each of the types and type constructions in our type system. Uh, so third is, okay, how do we deal with structures, with structs? So how could we define that two structures are equivalent? What do you think? Their members are all the same type. Their members are all the same type? How do you define members? Yeah, so we want uh, the types of the members at a very high level to be the same. Exactly. Uh, yeah. The order of the members. So, yeah, so the structure, right, has different fields. So that's kind of a question. So do we want the fields to be in the same order and have the same types? Is there anything else that we may want to be identical or that we could want to be identical? Yeah. Uh, functions will be rule five, I want to say. So we'll look at that in a second. Um, so we talked about definitely need to have all the same types, right? That, or not. So they need to have uh, the same types. They don't have to all be the same. Uh, we talked about the order. What about what are some other things in structures? What are, What are the properties of a structure? What does a structure have? The structure itself has a name, but what about inside the structure? It has an ordered list of types. An ordered list of types. There's one other thing that's missing, though. Size? Size is like a compiler detail. I wouldn't worry about that. We can get that from the number of the list, right? The size of the list. What is each? So you have zero, like I don't know zero one. You can think about the order or whatever. What do each of those have? So they have a type, but they also have something else. Name. You said it. Yeah, they have a name, right? So you also have the names of the fields. So yeah, do the names have to match? Yes. Yes. No. Not the structure. Not the structure. It has to go down to the bottom. I don't know. I can visually see it in my mind. So it's got to go, so 
I, it's a question for you. So if two structures have the same fields and the same the same field names and the same types, but in a different order, are those structurally equivalent? See some of you shaking your head no. Yeah? I don't I don't think so. Why not? I'm just going off the word structural. If you switch like a building like the third floor for the tenth floor, is it the same building as another one? That's a tricky question. But you but if you only ever reference the floors by name, then it would never matter to you if they switched one from the third floor to the tenth floor. So yeah, it's actually a tricky, uh, it's actually just something we need to decide. I mean, I say we, but I've already <coughs> pre-decided, obviously, but. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, but you're, you're thinking about the implementation of how a struct is actually implemented in C, but it doesn't have to be a contiguous block of memory where each type is specifically that much memory. Does it have to be like that? And if we know the types, then we can know, if we know the types beforehand and we know the fields, then we know how to generate code to properly move those around where they should be, right? So that when you reference field A, which is the first one, in this one type, in the next type you reference field A, it's actually the third element. But you can swap those around, right? That's not, that's not crazy. You have all the information to do that. Uh, so I guess the purpose of this discussion is we actually, that's one of the things we need to decide is how, what do we care about with structures? Do we care about the names or do we care about the order? Yeah? What value, what benefit do we get from that added level of complexity? Yeah, what, so that's another question is what, level of benefit do we get from that added level of complexity? And I guess I have been maybe a little facetious, or maybe playing devil's advocate, I haven't really decided, but uh, the, we are actually driven by what the performance characteristics of our program is, right? So for a language like C, yeah, we don't want to have to, when we copy structures, we don't want to have to move all the structures around, right? What we care about is how actually is that represented in memory and can I just copy that chunk of memory from one place to another to copy those structures? Um, so exactly, so that's what we're gonna go with is structure, the orders, the order of the types matter, the names of the fields don't matter at all. So we'll go with kind of more of a C style definition. You said the order didn't matter, sorry. <coughs> the order matters, the order of the types matters, that's the only thing that matters. The names of the fields don't matter at all. And I guess this does also help you if you ever did have a way you could construct, well, I guess that would make sense. Could you construct a structure with an anonymous field? I don't know. Probably not. Yeah. What about unions? What about unions? We're not going to get into those. Um, yeah, that, so that, um, you would have to make sure that the types in each of the unions were the same types that it could possibly be. Uh, but unions really mess up a type system because you can interpret one value as another value later, so that's why we're not gonna really touch it. Uh, so yeah, so this is how we're gonna find structural equivalence for structures. Um, so here we have structure one. It has uh, various field names, x1 through xk. Each of those have various types, W1 through WK. Then we have a structure two, which has field names Y1 through YK, and has type names Q1 through QK. Uh, so structures one and two are structurally equivalent if and only if what's true, based on what we said. So we wanna, yeah? WK is equal to, is, yeah, so WK is structurally equivalent to QK? Yes. For just the last one? Well, I'm talking all of them. Yeah, so all of them? One through K. One through K, yeah. Are there any other restrictions we need or want? <coughs> yeah. There's the same number of Ks 
There's the same number of k's. Yeah, I'll buy that. I'll say it's implied in kind of what we're doing, right? Because if you can't, if you're going through one through k of all of them and you get offset, right? That would be, uh, you're, they're not going to match. So, yeah. So w1 is structurally equivalent to q1. Uh, w2 is structurally equivalent to q2. All the way down to wk is structurally equivalent to qk. So do we care? So once again, so this is, so you can see in this definition here. We don't care about the x1s and the y1s, or the xks or the yks, right? We don't care about the names of the field. We just care about the type and the order of those types. Does that make sense? Okay, so if we had a structure A, it has type uh, int and float, and structure B, it has type int and float. We declare an A of called foo, we declare b called bar, can we set a is equal to bar? Why? So are they structurally equivalent? Yes? You say yes, why? Okay. What about the names? Yeah, we don't, we don't care about it. They don't matter. Exactly. So yeah, even though this structure B has a field A that is a float, and structure A has a field A that is an integer, we don't care about that. All we care are the types. Is the order of the types in, in, float, float? Boom. Done. That's all we care about. All right. And similarly, if we had a situation like this, can we set A equals to bar here? No. Why? <coughs> Yeah, the order doesn't match, right? The int, float, no, doesn't match, boom, done. All right, questions on determining equivalence of structural equivalence of structures? Yeah? So why is order important? Like, uh, in a structure, if we can say there is an int, it should contain an int. So yeah. why is order important? Uh, so I think this is, well, I think it's two reasons. One is it's a historical artifact. Uh, these used to be called records, and records had no field names. They just had offsets, basically, zero through whatever. Um, you also kind of think of it as a tuple in that sense. Uh, it's a certain number, but uh, anyways. But uh, so yeah, and the other reason is it's coming from the memory itself, right? So in a low-level language like C, a structure is literally however many bytes each of those fields are in memory contiguous like that. They're just grouped together. So it's a way of grouping eight bytes instead of always having an int and a float somewhere else. They're always right next to each other. And the compiler knows the offsets of all those things. So to copy one to the other, like in this case, we could just, boom, copy that memory over, and it's fine. Otherwise, if we had to worry about field names, then we'd have to copy the memory to the right places of the structure, and we're kind of like breaking apart the structure to do that. I was going to say you couldn't define it like that. You could. Uh, but for our purposes here, we're only caring about order. Order. Right. Okay. So we just talked about uh, structures. So now we want to say, okay, what? how do we define an array as being structurally equivalent? Uh, so we have two arrays. So when would two arrays be, array types be structurally equivalent? What do you think? Not saying. Use a different word. That's on the slide. As the title. They're structurally equivalent, right? Two. So the types of the array, so the types of each of the elements in the array have to be structurally equivalent, right? Um, and what about what was that? What was that? The length. Uh, so the range. Yeah, the range has to be the same. Uh, so yeah. So. We have two arrays, T1, which is an array of range one of some type T1. We have T2, which is an array of some range two of T2. And we can say that they're structurally equivalent uh, if and only if the range has the same number of dimensions, right? So we have multi-dimensioned arrays. Uh, and each of those dimensions is the same length, right? Because uh, it doesn't make sense. You can't have arrays of different lengths being the same type couldn't ever copy those over because you'd lose or gain information. Or not gain, but not have, yeah, not valid, yeah? How do you handle types that change their array length depending on how many values you put into it? 
So here we're defining an array as a as a type in the type system. So the way we define it, it always knows the type and it doesn't change throughout the program execution. So using something like a vector, you create like another class and you create a point. I mean, if you're talking about C, you create a pointer and all that stuff. So it would be another type that wouldn't have this restriction. Because in like C++, right, you create a vector class, you can assign one vector type, uh, a variable that's a type vector, to a variable of another type vector, assuming they're of the same generic type, right? But it doesn't check to see if they have the same length, so it can't do that at type checking time. But this is basically like, what if we baked in the size into our type checking system? Then we could check for these kinds of things. So there'd be cases where you want to, whether you know the array is only ever going to be this long, and then there'd be cases you wouldn't want to when it's going to be dynamic depending on the input. Okay, and as we said, the types T1 and T2 have to be structurally equivalent. Right? So as we can see this, every time we're comparing two types, we're always saying that they have to be structurally equivalent. Right? So we can just break this down by just keep pulling apart all these types, applying all these rules to say whether things are structurally equivalent. Right? We can have an array of structures, and each of those structures uh, could have like structures as part of its field, and so you just break it apart to make sure that the basic types match up. All right, so the fifth one, what's the fifth one? Functions, yeah, so uh, function structural equivalent. So we have two functions, and remember our, uh, the type of our functions where we have the parameters, one through k, and then we have some return type. Uh, so when would these be structurally equivalent? Yeah. If the what? The parameter types are not the same. Structurally equivalent. Yeah. So if the types T1 through TK are structurally equivalent to the types V1 through VK, uh, what else? Yeah? The order is the same? Yeah, definitely important. The names are different types? The return types are the same? What was that? The name function? The name of the function. So here we're not, we're not even thinking about the name. So just like, um, just like our anonymous structure, we can have function types that are not actually defined to a variable or assigned to a variable name. Okay, yeah, so we, our functions T1 and T2 are gonna be structurally equivalent if uh, for all i from one to k, ti is structurally equivalent to vi, so the types, the parameter types match up in the specific order, right? Because the order of the parameters to our functions matter, right? We can't just say two functions are the same, oh, this function accepts an int and a float, and this other function accepts a float and an int. Those types aren't the same, right? And t is structurally equivalent to v. So these are actually all the rules we need in order to determine and calculate structural equivalence between, two, between any two types in this little type system that we've created. <coughs> uh, and so what's our, so we want to determine structural equivalence. So what what is the goal? So our goal is we want to, for every pair of types in the program, we want to determine are they the same? Are they structurally equivalent? Um, so does, I mean, does this seem pretty straightforward? Yeah? So, for this case, we're thinking about structural equivalence as in terms of uh, being able to assign one variable to another. So this would be thinking, can you, so if you had some function as a variable, right, that had some signature including parameters and return type, could you assign that to another variable and use that in the same, in the same way? So unless those return types return structurally equivalent values, you can't do that because you, it, it could return a string, like one variable, like one function used would think, oh, it, this could return a string, whereas the other one it thinks, oh, this can use a, return an integer or something like that. 
Uh, so in this case specifically, for doing this, we really care about the return types of functions. Uh, whereas when we are doing overloading, we don't care about the return types. Um, so yeah, those are actually like separate concepts. Um, and in a language like, well, in a language like C, we can define types, function types of variables. Um, so yeah, uh, anyways, we'll, we'll see examples later. Uh, cool. Uh, so yeah, it seems pretty straightforward, right? We have these five rules, we just keep applying them, and at each point we can pull apart, we know how to pull apart that type, right? So if it's a function, we compare each of the parameter types to see if they're structurally equivalent. If it's a structure, we compare the order of the field of the types to see if they're structurally equivalent. And if it's a pointer, we kind of rip off the pointer part and see what's inside the, the, the that type, right? So we can do this to any arbitrarily crazy complex type, um, and we just keep doing this until the base case of one or two, or really, I think the base case of one is reached. Um, but the question comes up: So how do we handle the following case? So T1 is a structure. It has a field A, which is an integer, and it has a field P, which is a pointer to some type T2, where we define T2 as a structure of the first field name is A, type int, where the second field is a pointer to T1. So can we apply the five rules to this? Yeah, are T1 and T2 structurally equivalent? No. why not? Because P is not of the same type. But P is a pointer to T2, right? The P in T1 is a pointer to T2. P in T2 is a pointer to T1. So how do we find the structural equivalence of pointers? Look at the internal thing, what they point to. So the pointers in here are T2 to T1. So the question is, are T2 and T1 structurally equivalent? No. Well, why not? So then we look at the structure, and then we see, oh, the integers match. And the second field are pointers to T2 and pointers to T1. So we see, do those pointers match? Are the, are the pointers structurally equivalent? And to do that, we look inside the pointers. We look at T2 and T1, and we see, are those structurally equivalent? So yeah, we get into an infinite loop if we just try applying. I was wondering how long you guys were going to have me going for that. Uh, we should have done it like more, but we kept going. Anyways, so yeah, we just keep applying these rules, right? We get into this infinite recursion because we have a loop of, well, T1 is really depends on the type of T2 to see if these are structurally equivalent. Uh, so what about just, so just looking at this, are T1 and T2 structurally equivalent? Do you think they should be? They are, why? So if you don't, what, say that again, if you so don't? Like if you stop and you realize that they're, they're the ones are still, they're like the same types, you can, you can, without infinitely going down, you can see that they're exactly the same. So, I don't know how to write a program for it. <laughs> that's easy. Yeah, that's why you never have infinite loops or recursions in your program, right? You just detect when you're doing it and you stop doing it, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a good way to think about it, right? It's kind of like, okay, well, looking at this, well, you know, these, they're very similar, right? The only thing they differ on is T1 and T2, and those depend on each other. So they look very similar. So I guess another question could be, could we define a structure that was uh, a is an integer and P is a T2 and T2 is an A and P is a T1 without the pointers? Could you ever, so in that case, so in the case we're thinking about the types are in this loop, right? 
we're trying to type check and we type check one thing and then type check the other thing. Uh, but, but we could generate, like I'm talking C, we could generate the memory to fit this, right? We know an integer is a certain amount of bytes and we know a pointer to something is a certain amount of bytes. Right, so each of these has a fixed number of bytes. But without that pointer, now the structure itself is cyclical and infinite. So you could, yeah, you could never alloc you could never allocate this much memory because you're trying to say, okay, well, a T1 is first an int, okay, I can do that. But then it's a T2, okay, what's a T2? Well, T2 is an A and then it's a T1, which is an int and then a T2. So you can't calculate how big that is so you're never gonna get that to stop. Uh, so that's A, why we need to use the, the pointers here, so that, that way we could actually compile this if it type checks. Um, so the way we get around this paradox is we first assume that all the types are structurally equivalent, and then we go through trying to apply the rules, trying to disprove that they're not structurally equivalent because they violate one of these rules. Um, so if we did that here, right, if we start off assuming T1 and T2 are structurally equivalent, well then we say, well, are they the same? Well, they're structures, they both have two fields, that's good. Let's compare the first fields, two integers, that's good. Uh, let's compare the second fields, okay, they're both pointer types, that's good. Let's compare the inner pointer, uh, P2 and P1, are those the same? Yes, because we assumed that they were at the beginning. So we say they're the same, and then we say, great, these are actually structurally equivalent uh, types. Okay. So yeah, so that's the way to think about it. Is instead of constructing these types, we're going to apply the types trying to... We start off by assuming that they're all the same, that they're all structurally equivalent, and then we change that assumption if we find out that that's not true by comparing the types. Um, so our goal here, we're going to go through an algorithm, is that we want to create an n by n table where n is the number of types in the program, and each entry is true if the types are structurally equivalent, and false if they're not structurally equivalent. And so, in order to support these cyclical definitions, we first initialize all the entries in the table to true. Uh, so we essentially, you can think of it as we're assuming that all the types are structurally equivalent unless we have some proof uh, otherwise. And the algorithm here is fairly simple. So. I'm going to briefly go over to it, then we're going to look at an example. So we first set the table, every entry to be true, uh, while the table has not changed. We're going to basically go through, for each entry in the table, some i and j, we're going to say, okay, check those two types. If those two types are not structurally equivalent, then set that entry to be false. And then that's it, something changed and we do it again. And so we're going to keep going. And here, like T, I, and T, J are the A, I, and J types in the program, yeah? Would it be scarred by assuming that they're not equal? Uh, because we can't prove that they are equal. Because if they're cyclical, we're going to get to this whole thing where we keep trying to check and check and check and check. But if we start off by assuming that they are equal, and then go through it and say, ah, these are not equal because these things are different, great, those are not equal, and then we keep going until they're not structurally equivalent. Would it be that they're not equal, and then we check each element and then when you reach and they're not equal? I mean, could you do it that way? Maybe. This is actually really simple, and it gives you, it gives you the same answer, so this is like how it's done. Okay, so let's look at a quick example. So we have T1, T2, T3. So eyeball it right now. Are these all structurally equivalent? No. Are T1 and T2 structurally equivalent? Let's find out. Uh, so we're going to build our table, T1 through T2, T3, T1 through T3. We're going to set everything equal to true. Then we're going to start for, just go through the table, right? So we start with, well, T1, T1. So is this ever not going to be true? No, a, a type has to be structurally equivalent to itself, otherwise nothing makes sense in the world. Um, so we're going to ignore the diagonal. 
Uh, so we're going to check T1 and T2. So we check, okay, our T1 and T2 structurally equivalent. So we say, check the fields, two integers, great, two pointers. Check the insides of those pointers, T2 and T3. When we look up in the table, we see, aha, T2 and T3 are structurally equivalent. So right now it's structurally equivalent, great. Then we move on to T1 and T3, and we say int float, ah, that's not right. These are not structurally equivalent. So we're going to change that to false. But remember, the table is symmetric, right? So T1, T3 is going to be the same as T3, T1. So we're going to change that value also to be false. Uh, then we're going to check the other value here, T1, T3. We check int to float. Say, nope, not a match. They're not structurally equivalent. We're going to set that to be false. Set the corresponding one to be false. Uh, then we're going to, so we change something, right? So just like first and follow sets, we're going to go through it one more time. And we're going to say, OK, check T1, T2. Uh, check that integer, integer. Uh, pointer to T2, pointer to T3. Check the inside type. Is T2 equal to T3? No, false. Right? We just updated it to be false, not structurally equivalent. So we're going to update our table. Uh, we're going to go through it one more time, see that nothing changes. So we can see that these types are, in fact, not structurally equivalent. So that's it. Uh, see you all later. Have a good fall break. Hey.